Now, our election night coverage continues with a team that is going to be joining us at this table all night long. They are New York Times columnist David Brooks, Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report, Andra Gillespie of Emory University, Republican strategist Stuart Stevens, Democratic strategist Cornell Belcher, and right here sitting next to me, Mark Shields, syndicated columnist, and joining us from New York, Jeff Greenfield, who's been reporting for the NewsHour weekend throughout this campaign. So thank you to all of you for being here. I'm going to turn to you, David Brooks. You just heard the Democratic leader of the House of Representatives talk about, frankly, the problems Democrats have in states that used to be all blue. Yeah, and I, it struck me that she didn't uh, claim they were going to take over the House. <laughs> a bit of realism there from Nancy Pelosi, I think, but optimism and maybe well-earned optimism. It is still a party, a, a problem for the party that working class voters, white working class voters, are more and more heavily Republican. One of the exciting things that happened, whether you like it or not, uh, this year was that the white working class took over a party. And they took over a party that had formerly been a corporate party of the rich and the mass and the elites. And that's sort of an amazing thing that one, that happens in American, rarely in American history. We have a problem with your microphone, David Brooks. We're going to fix that and come right back to you in a minute. In a minute. <laughs> Amy Walter. Hi, Judy. <laughs> Hello. Uh, and, and I think this may play out in the House tonight as we're watching these results come in. If the results play out as the poll numbers have suggested, where the Democrats are going to pick up seats will be in places that were formerly Republican, inner city su or inner suburbs that were very Republican for m much of our history, now trending more Democratic as white college educated voters move into the Democratic column. As working class whites have moved out, white educated voters have moved into the Democratic column. And at the same time, in places like the Iron Range in Minnesota, that upper rural part of Minnesota, you could see Republicans winning there, as, as a district that Democrats have held for many, 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 many years. So it's, it's really like a tale of two congressional districts, right? We're going to swap out the suburbs for the more rural areas. This has been happening over the last 10 years, but sort of an, at a, at an accelerated pace. I think this election cycle. Stuart Stevens, are Nancy Pelosi's expectations reasonable? Um, I, I think probably she's going to probably call it pretty what's close to what's going to happen. Um, you know, the big test I think tonight for the Trump campaign, and it's going to affect these down ballot races, is what happens with white college educated voters. This has been a strong uh, center of support for uh, Republicans. No Republican has lost this in modern history. Even Goldwater won white at college educated Republicans. So if Donald Trump, who has been losing them in polls, does not carry them tonight, I think it's going to have uh, very interesting consequences up and down the ballot in some of these races. Mark Shields, what are you looking at tonight? Uh, well, I'm looking at the fact that uh, we're going to make history. I mean, either we'll elect uh, the first person in the history of the country who has never held a public office or served in the military uh, of any kind, and Donald Trump, or we'll elect the first woman. Uh, and uh, only for the second time since World War II, we got a possibility of electing a party to a third term in the White House. Happened with George H.W. Bush in 1988, uh, and hasn't happened uh, other than that. I, I think the Democrats have a real problem. Uh, culturally, I think they've become a cultural party, um, and I think a little late um, and uh, somewhat condescending toward uh, white, blue-collar uh, working Americans. Um, and I think the, the De Republicans had a great opening there. Um, Democrats are obviously far more comfortable with uh, coastal types than they are with uh, people in the heartland. Cornell Belcher, I saw you <laughs> smile broadly when Mark said that. Well, it, it, it's interesting that Democrats are now back-to-back -back majorities in the in national elections, and somehow the problem is Democrats have a cultural problem with working-class whites. I think Democrats do have a, a problem with working-class whites, but if you look into the future, I think the larger problem is a problem that Republicans have I, with the ascending electorate, right? Uh, it's a point of diminishing returns at some point uh, with working-class whites. Do Democrats need to be do better with working-class whites? Absolutely they do, but without a question, when we see the when we see her recobble together that ascending uh, electorate that makes up a majority in this country, now, I think you're going to—it's going to be hard pressed to say that that right now Democrats are the ones with the problem. I, can I just uh, dissent just briefly from uh, Cornell? Get this at the evening heated early. Uh, and, and that, <laughs> that, is, that is this: the Democrats, uh, in spite of assembling this national coalition and this majority, uh, are non-competitive in the House of Representatives. They're frankly non-competitive, and they're non-competitive in districts that are basically blue-collar 
white, uh, more conservative culturally. But uh, Mark, and, what about? But isn't that have a lot to do with, quite frankly, gerrymandering? I mean, we've gerrymandered these districts where they weren't where, gerrymandered where, in 2010, Cordell. That's all. Uh, well, no, they no. were gerrymandered just before 2010. No, you, no, you, they weren't. Yeah, no, they, they weren't. Friend, it was the 2010 census that led to the. Well, to the, to the we, well, they're even worse now. I mean, once upon a time in this in this country, you did have 30 or 40 congressional districts that were, because when I was working at the DCCC, you really did have a lot more congressional districts that were highly contested. That number is shrinking a lot now, and it has to do with people like me who, who are helping to draw these maps precisely the way to keep incumbents in office. Hmm. But, okay. Audra Gillespie, you wanted to chime in there? So if, I jump, if I'll jump in here, what I, I would say is it's not just gerrymandering. It, we also have to consider the ways that we've ideologically sorted yes. ourselves into partisan camps yes. in ways that we hadn't before. A generation ago, you had liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. Those don't exist anymore. So people understand enough about parties to know which issues and which bundles fall into which parties, and they've fallen into those camps. So the question for tomorrow is, can people reach beyond the aisles and actually talk to people who disagree with them? Amy Walter, you're nodding. Yeah, well, and we are self-sorting now more than ever. When you talk to dem demographers, they'll tell you that we are moving ourselves into areas that relate to our own, where we're most comfortable socio in socio-cultural ways. And if you look, for example, at the question, Pew has asked this question, I think it's fantastic. Do you want to live in a place that's a close an area where you can walk everywhere, or but you have a smaller house, or you get a bigger house and a bigger yard, but you have to drive everywhere? Guess what? 75% of liberals want the close in suburb. 75% of conservatives want the place where you have to drive. And so literally, people are putting themselves into different communities and separating themselves. Jeff Greenfield, I want to invite you into this conversation. Are the old boundaries still relevant today? Less and less. Uh, it, it's just striking to me that, you know, the Democratic Party has been the party of the working man and, and later working woman since the days of Andrew Jackson. And as late as 1992, when whites were a far bigger pr proportion of the electorate, Bill Clinton effectively split the white vote with his Republican opponents both in 92 and 96. And one of the things that I think has happened is that the, the, the focus on mobilization, get your vote out, has I think had a big cost, which is that the candidates, even th they will use the rhetoric, the pieties, but in substantive ways, do not speak to the broader country because it has become harder and harder to speak to the broader country. And I think whatever happens tonight, uh, this campaign has been a loss to, to, to the civic nature of what a campaign is supposed to be like because the strategy of both campaigns has been get your folks out and the heck with the other folks. David Brooks, if your microphone is fixed, I want to ask you to, to come into this conversation about whether we are making what was already a bad situation worse. I was wondering why Mark was meddling with my microphone. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think one of the things, there's been the polarization, but there's also the heat. And tonight is often is a lot about the heat with which this campaign has been conducted. And what makes night, tonight significant is, A, the size of the margin and the nature of the concession speech. And whether we are a country, we're certainly a divided country. This, uh, this election has been like a, a flash flood that wipes away all the soil and reveals all the chasms that have been dividing us and exacerbates them. But whether we are even one country after tonight, if Democrats win, how Trump reacts will be super important. If Trump wins, Democrats will be stunned, and a lot of people will be stunned. And how Clinton reacts at that moment will be super duper important. Yeah, exactly. Andra, I want you to speak about that because there's been a, I've, I've been hearing conversation for days now about the, what's the reaction going to be like. It's yes, the results are important, but are people even going to be able to deal with the results, whatever side you're on? There have been some surveys in the past couple of weeks where people have asked, been asked that question, and they've said that they're not going to be happy about this. And so I think we can expect that half the country is going to wake up upset tomorrow. And that's why it's really important for whoever loses to accept defeat graciously and also for the winner to accept de uh, to accept winning graciously and also send out a conciliatory bomb to the other side. It's not going to be enough, sadly, and I think that it's going to be pretty contentious going after that. But I think tonight is the night where both candidates can change the tone enough that they can actually get us through, you know, at least the next couple of months so that we can set up a new government. Stuart Stevens, what incentive does Donald Trump have or Hillary Clinton have to change the tone today? Um, listen, I think one of the key elements of democracy is somebody has to be willing to lose. Um, <laughs> and, and what's been extraordinary, I think, about Donald Trump's comments is challenging that. 
uh, before you even have results. It's one thing if there's a razor thin margin like 2,000. Um, we have one person winning the Electoral College ultimately and one person winning the popular vote. Okay, that took 31 days. It was a nightmare for the country. But to prejudge this and start talking about a rigged system, I think is very corrosive to the whole process. Our process is out there amongst these states with thousands and thousands of local officials, many of them Republicans, and they're really good and decent people. Doesn't mean mistakes don't happen. I mean, we're going to have, you know, 140, 50 million people voting tonight. There are going to be mistakes. But the system isn't rigged. And I think that. You, to put that out there is something we need to try to heal as soon as possible. Cornell Belcher, whose responsibility is it to try to do this healing? I mean, leadership matters, and this shouldn't be a partisan thing. I mean, look, uh, John McCain, after losing, he called Barack Obama my president, right? That is a tradition in this country right now. And, and I fear what's happening right now is that we're losing sight of, of, of that tradition and so much of the anger of, 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 our, of our politics. Uh, it is important, whether you're Democrat or you're Republican, that you embrace uh, our system because it is not rigged. And the moment our people start thinking, and I'm concerned about in the polling numbers that I'm seeing as well, with so many more people are actually thinking the system is rigged. That is how we lose our democracy when people don't believe in the system anymore and they don't accept uh, the outcome of our, of our politics. What Donald Trump, because I think Donald Trump's going to lose, when Donald, what Donald Trump does tonight, I think it's going to be very, very important, not just for for him and his brand, but for our country. But, you know, think about where we were. Even in 2000, that was a very contentious election. We always remember the aftermath of the election. But going into that election, George W. Bush, his overall favorable, unfavorable rating was plus 23. It's the highest that we'd seen since we'd been looking back for the last 20 years. So he was very, po he was viewed very positively. Now we're going into an election where both candidates obviously viewed negatively. Hillary Clinton somewhere around minus 10 or 15. Donald Trump even lower than that, maybe at 20, minus 20 or minus 30. So the, there's no residual goodwill there that at least George W. Bush had something to go on. Neither one of these candidates have any of that to start with. You know, I, I think this is what parties are so important at this moment because parties have to step forward and do what the candidates uh, sometimes find difficult to do. All right. All right, we're going to have many opportunities today yes, to come back go. to all of you, so save those thoughts. Uh, 